Iron oxide gets formed on the surface of the steel as it heats in the forge, returning it to a similar state to how we find it in the earth. As you look at those oxides, you see that work has been done. These oxides are a product of that work. Throughout our history, iron has allowed mankind to do so many different things, and it helped us evolve into the culture that we have now. It's amazing to think back into history about how many people have done this craft before us. It's, it's a very primal thing to start a fire. I think I'm very fortunate to be able to do this kind of thing now where it, so much is automated and create all of these different patterns. That's a thing that has been a driving force behind my work with swords, trying to make something uniquely my own. When the project came in, it was to basically build a long sword and they gave us all of the leeway that we wanted in doing that. In a lot of this, it was kind of an opportunity to work on things larger than we have in the past. And so for this sword, I created this tile with these long kind of tendrils. So then my pattern was a serpent. And then from there, what I did is I forged that serpent down into a straight bar. And I did that on two bars that then mirror each other. So at the base of the blade, we have a pattern on the edges that weaves in and out. What you would think, you know, take a bar, forge it into a sword. I take the bar, I slice it up into a whole bunch of pieces. I reorganize them. And then I weld all those together in the forge and create my blade from there. Handles are really important because the blade is just a potential weapon. To really sort of reach fruition as a weapon, you've got to make a handle that gives feedback to the user, that lets him know even with his eyes shut or out of his visual range, where is the blade, what's its orientation, you know, what's it doing right now. It's really a communications tool. And then, of course, the other important part of handle making is um, bling. Non-ferrous metals work in the exact opposite way that steel does. So Jamie quenches the blade to make it hard. I quench all the metals I work with to make them soft. It's not really smithing, it's sculpture and sort of fine bench work. What it starts with is you gotta get design. And that took a while because we were trying to incorporate elements from their games and try and reflect the company a bit in the handle. Well, the first thing you do once you've got that design is you have to translate this 2D drawing into 3D carvings in wax. Once you've got your injected waxes and you assemble them, you got to fit it to the blade, invest it in plaster, burn the wax out, which is why it's called the lost wax method, and then pour hot bronze in where the wax was. Then I usually do the handle, which is a wooden core, and that gets covered with leather, and then the back part got covered with twisted wire. To me, fire has always been very comforting. I've always loved 
being near fires. I've always loved having campfires and burning stuff. You know, the physical exertion of swinging a hammer, how each hammer stroke affects the steel, the satisfaction of being able to manipulate the steel into the shape that I want it to be is very gratifying. It gratifies me to know that these things are going to live on a lot longer than I am. And I hope that when the sword gets given, it then gets passed down through the family that's been given to it. Every time you do something that's at the edge of the envelope or new, you improve yourself. And I'm getting better each sword. Every time you do it, you, you learn something. You get a little better at this. If you stop getting better, well, hopefully it's because you died. I think about in a hundred years, how many people are going to see the swords that I've made in 200 years, in 500 years? Will any of them make it a thousand years? I like to think that maybe one of them will last, you know, maybe I can get like 600 years, that'd be pretty good. I'd be happy with that. <laughs>